as a firm, there's probably three key things that we're trying to achieve in our portfolios and are really quite important to understand how we go about building our portfolios. The first of those things is capital preservation. Uh, at the core of what we're wanting to achieve, throughout market cycles, as much as possible, we're trying to preserve client capital. Now, a lot of people talk about this in the industry, but as I'll talk about later, industry portfolios aren't structured to actually achieve this. So when we talk about capital preservation, we quite literally mean we're wanting to ensure or try and effectively ensure that the client portfolios don't lose value during market downturns. Now, it's important to understand that that doesn't mean that these are absolute return funds or capital guaranteed funds, because they're not. It just means we spend a lot of time building and constructing the portfolio to try and affect an outcome whereby if the market's down 10, 15%, the portfolios are generally going to have a, a flat to, at worst, a slightly negative return during that time frame. And that's again been consistent with what we've been able to achieve now for many, many years. The second thing that we talk about is we want to understand first and foremost the amount of risk we're able to take. And then once we understand the risk, we try and maximise the returns from that. So a simple example that we often give to people is if you have an option to buy an investment that gives you an 8% return or an investment that gives you a 14% return, many people instantly say, well, I'll take the investment with the 14% return. Now, the difficulty with that is what could be implicit in that return is a much, much higher risk. So if we said to you that the 14% return came from buying a Taliban bond or a uh, similar, you know, exotic uh, debt instrument, clearly that wouldn't be attractive as if the 8% return came from an Australian major bank's unsecured debt. A very simple example, but at the heart of it, again, it often gets missed in the investment industry. So we, as I said, focus first on risk and then try to understand how we can maximise the return. And the final thing, which is very much a, a philosophical element about what we try and achieve, is we're really trying to achieve a much more consistent return outcome in the portfolios than typically gets offered. Uh, and we do this really by trying to ensure that the portfolio is not exposed to any single factor or any single risk that's going to drive it. Uh, and I'll talk about it in a minute about how the industries uh, typically fall short of this by virtue of their portfolios being dominated by a single risk factor. And the most obvious of these is equity market risks. So as the equity market goes up or the equity market falls, if inherently your portfolio is heavily, heavily exposed to equity markets, then no matter how much you talk about capital preservation or predictable return outcomes, the reality is, is that your portfolio returns have no choice to be dominated by that. It's actually important to understand the genesis of our investment philosophy and where that's come from. Ultimately, we do manage the majority of the money on behalf of mum and dad investors. And ultimately, a mum and a dad is focused on capital preservation and generating positive absolute returns throughout market cycles. Now, we get reminded of this literally on a daily basis by our client base. And being a small firm, we're also not limited to some of the structural issues that personally as an investment professional, I would face in other larger firms where there are other commercial interests which come before client interests. So why are we different? Well, at its core, the way the industry goes about building uh, investment portfolios is what's called strategic asset allocation, or SAA. And what SAA does is for different client risk profiles, it basically predefines the allocations you're going to have to different investment buckets. So for example, a client might be told to have 25% in Australian equities, 25% in international equities, and then another range of investments through property, fixed income, cash, etc. Now the problem with this is it absolutely takes no consideration into what the underlying valuations are or the relative attractiveness of each of those individual assets. So what it means is even if the investment professional thinks that property, for example, is an unattractive investment at that point in time, which was the case, for example, prior to the GFC, 
they're still required to make an allocation into that asset class. And as I used property as an example there, we saw that going into the GFC, where property was materially, materially overvalued. It was trading 50% above its net tangible asset base. It was also had a distribution yield, which was low government bonds, and its gearing levels was at exorbitant levels. Now, ultimately, investment professionals in the industry approach were still forced to allocate around 15% of their portfolios to this as an asset class, even if individually they didn't believe in it. It's a similar example we give today for where duration fixed income is, and by that I mean government debt. So the US 10-year bond yield is currently sitting at around 1.5%. What that means is that the most you could make on a through the cycle view on a 10-year bond yield is probably close to zero if inflation's already running at 1.5%. So a zero real return is the best you can make, and then you've obviously got the potential to lose money if interest rates continue to rise from there. Now, that's not an overly compelling investment option, but what makes it worse is if an investment professional is forced to put 20, 30, 40% of the portfolio into investments like that. And that ultimately is how the industry goes about allocating capital through strategic asset allocation. The th second thing we're trying to do is ensure that the portfolios aren't dominated by a single risk factor. And this really came out through the GFC when you saw how heavily market portfolios fell as equity markets fell. And the reason is, is higher risk profile portfolios, which are typically called balanced or growth portfolios, ultimately contain 70 to 80% of the portfolios in equities. So no matter how good you are, if you have 80% of your portfolio sitting in equities and the equity market falls 50%, as it did, it's very, very difficult to do anything but to generate a very, very material negative return there. And again, that's one of the reasons earlier I mentioned capital preservation is key to what we're doing, but industry portfolios aren't structured in a manner that can genuinely offer capital preservation in certain circumstances. And again, unfortunately, the GFC showed that up all too easily. The other element, though, is trying to understand what an appropriate benchmark is. Um, a key shortcoming of the industry is viewing a benchmark as being risk-free. Now, we don't think that too many of our clients are happy if the benchmark's down 30% and we're down 20%, wanting congratulations about how great we are because we only lost them 20% of their capital, not 30% akin to the benchmark. So it's defining risk in an absolute sense, not in a relative sense to an industry benchmark or an industry norm, which in its own right may well be flawed. And the final thing is really important to ensure that the commercial interests of the firm are aligned with the client. So we often get asked questions by leading industry uh, participants on how we're able to structure the portfolios in a manner that we are. Because ultimately for them, one of the things they define as risk is how their current investment portfolios differ from their competitors. And why that's important for them to understand is because if equity markets, for example, were up materially and they had a lot less in there, then their performance is not going to be as good as their competitor. So it's less about the absolute return that they're trying to generate or the positive return they're trying to generate and more the relative return again they're trying to generate, again in this instance relative to their competitors. Because ultimately their business models driven by how they perform compared to the rest of the industry. Where we're different is we're wanting to put the client's interests first by virtue of defining the mandate and then defining how we're trying to generate a return relative to those mandate expectations. In terms of our investment objectives, uh, they're really quite simple. We're trying to maximise the amount of return we can make for any, any given level of risk. Now, what that means at its core is we're trying to find individual investments that we think are attractive on a standalone basis. And if you think one of the industry shortcomings was allocating capital to things on a predefined manner, uh, we're trying to take a completely other approach. It's almost you start with a blank sheet of paper and say, what do we actually think is attractively priced and it doesn't need to be mispriced, 
uh, but can just generate a return that's commensurate with the amount of risk that you're taking. And what we want to ensure that for everything in the portfolio, that we would be happy to hold that on a standalone basis. And what I mean by that is if we couldn't hold anything else, but just had to hold that single investment, you would still be comfortable that that single investment would be an attractive investment opportunity. Now, if you've done that on an individual basis, and that doesn't only mean uh, individual investments, but the collective investments that sit within the investment class, such as equities. Uh, the second thing is, is when you're building the portfolio out, we're 100% focused on ensuring that it's very well diversified. So diversification is one of the free lunches, uh, to use an industry term, that you get. And what that means is, is you can combine together attractive investments and their collective risk of that portfolio is lower than the individual risk by virtue of the fact uh, that they offset each other in different times. Now, in doing that, we keep talking about capital preservation. We're very, very focused on when we combine those things together, we spend a lot of time assessing what the, what the structural risks are of those individual investments and how those things will sit together, together as a portfolio. And simplistically, I've used the term factors before. Uh, factors are anything that sits within a portfolio or within investment that will drive its return. So a couple of obvious ones are equity market, interest rates or currency. And using those three as examples, we look at the portfolio and say, what is the exposure of this portfolio to equity market risk? What's the exposure of this portfolio, for example, to interest rate risk? And what's the exposure of the portfolio to currency risk. And in doing that, you understand that if there's an unexpected move in any of those individual variables, that the portfolio is still going to perform or not, not have its performance materially detracted from. And again, we use the example of how an industry portfolio that has 80% of its allocation to equities, no matter what the other 20% is allocated to, if you have 80% of your portfolio exposed to the equities market, and that equities market falls 50%, as it did during the global financial crisis, then ultimately there's absolutely very little an investment professional can do to generate a positive return or to preserve capital. That portfolio, almost by definition, will lose material amounts of money. So diversification is something that's very, very critical for us. The final thing we then do from that is we're really then trying to understand in different times of stress, and there's always going to be uh, stress that comes into the investment markets, and we've been seeing that unfortunately all too frequently in recent years, understand how that portfolio is going to perform, or we expect it to perform, uh, should uh, stress come into the marketplace. Similarly, whilst capital preservation is a key, key focus, we're also wanting to understand um, that we don't have too much um, uh, conservative positions in the portfolio and similarly that we're able to participate on the upside. Okay. One of the things we're very focused on as a firm is ensuring that we have the right people on board to help us manage the portfolios effectively. Uh, the team of people that we've built are exceptional from an industry standpoint. Ultimately, everyone comes from an institutional background and the senior members of the team have all been responsible for managing billions and billions of dollars on behalf of institutional clients. Each of the members of the team also have worked for some of the largest uh, investment groups globally and they've done that both domestically as well as offshore. It's certainly something that we're focused on, ensuring that we have the right resources in place and we'll continue to build that team out as we grow to be able to do all the internal research, both at, be it macroeconomic or individual investment research, that's necessary to manage the client capital in an effective manner. So ultimately we've spent quite a bit of time talking about risk and I thought it was appropriate to actually give a little more flavour about what we mean when we talk about risk. At its core, when we talk about the mandate that the risk, sorry, the amount of risk that a mandate can take, what we mean by that is the volatility of returns. So the expected deviation or variance 
that a return stream of the portfolio should look like. Now, ultimately, the higher risk of an investment, the more its path can deviate over time. But risk is ultimately far more than that. And there's a number of other very, very important things that we focus on to ensure that our investment objectives are met. Uh, the first of these is something that's got all too much attention in recent years because of the amount of uh, capital loss that's occurred through fraud. Uh, we spend a very, very amount of large, large amount of time trying to understand what counterparty risk we have. So as an investment team, we're indifferent as to whether we allocate money directly into the market, so we buy equities, for example, directly on a stock exchange, or at times we utilise an external manager or a third party uh, investment professional to access some of those investment opportunities for us. And that's typically a very sensible thing to do in areas of specialty such as emerging markets or international equities. But in doing that, that provides a whole range of other risks into the portfolio. And counterparty risk is a good example. And we spend a large amount of time doing due diligence uh, on external managers or external structures where money is held. Similarly, we spend a lot of time ensuring that liquidity risk is managed. So we never want to find ourselves in a circumstance where the underlying portfolio is not highly liquid. So we never really make an investment into something where we don't understand the underlying investment, or similarly, it's not transparent. And all too frequently, uh, in recent years, investors have been caught investing into something that had a very good return stream, but ultimately, the underlying transparency of how that return stream was being generated uh, was not there. So again, we won't make an investment unless that transparency and comfort around liquidity is there. The other element that's got too much attention recently is credit risk. And this is also related to counterparty risk. But ultimately in the investment industry, you're exposed to a range of things like uh, custodians, um, in ba banks, etc. And we want to make sure that if any point a fiduciary, such as a, a, a bank, is holding the assets, we spend a lot of time understanding what the credit risk is around those intermediaries, such that that sort of risk is managed in the portfolio. So whilst the volatility returns and the underlying cash flows that each of the investments are generating are important to us, there's a whole range of other risks that we seek to manage in the portfolios as well to ensure that those investment objectives we're trying to attain for our clients aren't impeded.